So we'll kind of take a step back in history now. We sit on Millbrook, uh, and that's a tributary of, of the Connecticut River. The next thing that happened was the railroad, and that allowed now goods to be moved back and forth. The U.S. government puts out a tender for 10,000 rifles, and there was a clause in the contract. The parts must be interchangeable. There was no system for manufacturing parts by machine to make everything interchangeable. And like all good manufacturers, we like to bid on jobs and then get them and say, hmm, I guess I got to figure out how to make them now. It's now 1851, and it's the great exhibition of industrial works at the Crystal Palace in London. Robbins and Lawrence are invited to go over and show what they can do. They go over with six sets of guns, rifles, they put them on the table, and the Brits are absolutely amazed that all the parts can be interchanged. So our, our goal here is pretty straightforward. We want to inspire a new generation of makers, engineers, innovators, and so forth on the backdrop of history. Right? We want to know, explain to young people, particularly fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students, that you came from someplace. Right? This, this, all this modern technology just didn't happen. So a few years ago, Myself and a board member got together and said, where do we start our story from? And we realized that we started our story too late in history. We started our story talking about parts made by machine. But if you want to talk about manufacturing and its origins, you have to talk about parts being made by hand. So in the 1840s, which is where we start our history in this building, uh, Guns, particularly guns, were all made by hand. You had a gunsmith that was making the parts, fabricating them. Uh, they were very local here. Um, some rudimentary machines did exist, but for the most part, the machines were made by hand, and each gun is unique. When you make a part by hand, every part is slightly different. No different than if a painter paints the same scene twice. There'll always be subtle differences between the pictures. Um, and that's what happened here. So our first display is all about made by hand. Okay? And there was two, two gentlemen here in Windsor, uh, Kendall and Lawrence, and they were gunsmiths right across the river. And they were practiced just making guns by hand, custom made things. Um, and that's where we started our story from. The gentleman at the Board of Advisors said, Unless you become relevant to the people you serve, you'll cease to exist. And we took that to heart. And our people that we serve is the manufacturing industry. We're the beacon of precision manufacturing, right? We're the holder of their history. History. So we had to reinvent the museum again <laughs> in order to make it relevant. And now we have this new great opportunity in front of us where we're going to be and Dave can talk more to it, but we're gonna be renovating the back second half of this building to build an education center that'll again reinforce the principles of manufacturing through STEM education and other kinds of education programs uh, to keep building on that. As, as I mentioned before, there was two gunsmiths, Lawrence and Kendall, they were working right across the river. The US government puts out a tender for 10,000 rifles and there was a clause in the contract the parts must be interchangeable. Right. So along comes a third guy, his name is Samuel Robbins. Samuel Robbins is a young guy. He made a lot of money timbering in Maine and through Boston. He comes up to Lawrence and Kendall and says, hey, there's a government tender for 10,000 rifles that have to have interchangeable parts. I'll financially back you if we can do it. And like all good manufacturers, we like to bid on jobs and then get them and say, hmm, I guess I gotta figure out how to make them now, make the parts now. And that's basically what happened here. There was no system for manufacturing parts by machine to make everything interchangeable. They take on the contract, they win it for $10.90 a gun, but the building you're standing in was not built yet, and nor were any of the machines necessary to make this thing happen. 
uh, make this process happen was even built up yet or collected yet. So take a look at this backdrop or this panel. This is what the compound looked like in the 1846 era. The buildings, there's apartments right across the river from here. That These were the buildings. These were workmen's quarters and foundries. They bring parts across the bridge into the building you're standing in now where they were assembled and the woodworking components were added. Part of our mission is, is to change that narrative that manufacturing and manufacturing jobs are dark, dirty, and dangerous and dull. dull. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's changed and, and uh, we're trying to highlight that change. And um, you know, we see our mission as preserving the history of manufacturing, educating about it, and then the last piece is that inspiration, inspiring the next generation. If you are a young person and you say, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, or engineer, you have only one choice, one path to go to, right? And that's to college. But if you choose manufacturing, now you've got this, this path that has multiple places that you can go with college education, without college education. So one of the first machines that we have on display is a horizontal mill. One of the big innovators at the time was Frederick Howe. Frederick Howe uh, was a great machine inventor, and we'll be talking a little bit more about some of his other machines as well, but he invented this one. Frederick Howe, I think, ultimately goes to Pratt & Whitney. As a machine, it's not very remarkable. It's really just a horizontal spindle. Uh, but what is kind of remarkable for 1846, 1850 is the form cutter. In the vise here, we have a lock plate that was cast near net shape. And prior to this machine, uh, the gunsmith would file the shape until he'd get it to fit the way he wanted. Now with this form cutter, they would be able to take all the material in one pass and be able to have the form that they needed without filing. So, as I, we started out our story with made by hand, and now we're transitioning ourselves to what is known as made by machine. So the next machine, you have a lock plate. The lock plate has to fit into the gun stock very accurately. So again, using the same kind of a principle, same kind of thinking, now they stack up a number of plates. This is the pattern stack here, with each one of these being a different pattern. Here is the follower that would follow one of these shapes. The cutter goes along for the ride and it would cut the pocket into the wooden sock. Uh, now the magic happens. The belt, which is being driv driving the spindle here, the operator moves it to the next position, which is now an idling position. The operator moves the indexes, the turret, brings in another follower with another cutter to pick up another spot on the pattern stack. So what this becomes is one of the first examples of tool changing okay. that you see on the, in the history chain. So the next machine we have here is a gun stock lathe. This one was uh, Thomas Blanchard. Um, Thomas Blanchard was another one of these inventors that in the Precision Valley that just started figuring things out. Um, a gun stock, again, same principle again that we've been talking about. We have to take the human hand out of the equation. So here they made a pattern of a gun stock. This follower would follow the pattern. The cutter goes along for the ride. And then this, as it's turning, follows the pattern and cuts the gun stock. So the big question that comes in next is why? <laughs> why are we doing all this? Why was this so important in the evolution of machining and, and manufacturing? Well, the first benefit, of course, was part accuracy. By taking the human hand out of the process, either through templates or form tools or patterns, uh, we begin to get better accuracy of our parts. Parts become repeatable. Um, they're consistent, so that was the first big benefit. The next big benefit that we have is process improvement. If we were able to bring the made become more efficient, the cost would come down. Bringing the cost down suddenly made 
the products more available to more than the masses. Then the last big benefit, factories were the center of community. Right? If you had a factory in your community in the 1850s, early 1900s or so, it was a big deal. Right? These factories took care of their workers, they paid them well, they gave them new opportunities, uh, they formed, the companies formed local relationships with suppliers and banks, uh, they held picnics for their employees, concerts on the green, all those kinds of things were suddenly uh, very important to your community by having a factory there. Uh, so again, not so much so different today. We're going to fast forward a little bit in time. It's now 1851, and it's the great exhibition of industrial works at the Crystal Palace in London. Um, Robbins and Lawrence are invited to go over and show what they can do. They go over with six sets of guns, rifles. They put them on the table, and the Brits are absolutely amazed that all the parts can be interchanged. They can just put them out there and do it, and everything is great. They get all excited and they order another 10,000 guns. But what's more important to the Brits is they want the machine tools. They want the process to set up at the Enfield Armory. And so they, now suddenly this factory starts not only producing rifles, but producing the machine tools as well. So I don't know if it's the beginning or it's pretty close to the beginning of the machine tool exporting industry from the United States. So 1856 rolls around. Robbins and Lawrence overexpands and goes out of business. Okay, but all is not lost because the Brits had coined the phrase the American system of manufacturing at that point. So this really becomes an incubator site. After uh, the armory broke up, uh, Robbins and Lawrence, all the, the apprentices and those that had been trained or created and invented things right here, they started moving down river. And they bring along the American system of manufacture with them. So we do have a kind of a genealogy here of Robbins and Lawrence. Um, you can see things like sharps, rifle, weed sewing machine, uh, Providence Tool and War Tool Works, which was Frederick Howe again, uh, Brown and Sharp, all had their origins here, all right, all coming out of Robbins and Lawrence. We believe the Precision Valley runs from around Windsor, Vermont, down through Hartford and New Haven. Here, in this point in history, that we've kind of transitioned ourselves from made by hand to made by machine, and now we have to start talking about machines that begin to make more machines. 1938 was a big period of time, period of time in the history. Bridgeport comes along. Um, and this, of course, Bridgeport becomes the name. Um, Rudy Bano is the inventor of the Bridgeport. Uh, they're making heads to fit on various types of machines, and then he invents the rest of the machine. This one is serial number one. Uh, people literally come from around the country to see Bridgeport serial number one. Eventually the wars end, and so what do you do with your factory uh, that was making guns all this time? So you now retool it for what we talk about as the consumer culture. Uh, suddenly bicycles, sewing machines, the kitchen gadgets, all these things become, become needed. But you enter into all that with all of the knowledge you've learned from the American system of manufacture. Right, you learned how to make parts repeatably and interchangeable, and all that kept the consumer prices down uh, and allowed you know, the masses to start having all these conveniences, as we call them. You know, here we'll have, we have more machine tools, of course, but at this point, we want to start introducing other processes, additive specifically. Uh, we try to explain the difference between subtractive and additive uh, 
get people into the idea that there's other things out there. Um, we make all different parts. We give parts away and we, we do things, different materials. At some point you have to start thinking about what's, how do you move forward in time, right? So thanks to our partnership with Haas and Mitoco and uh, lots of different, and Renishaw, we've been able to put together an innovation station uh, so we can demonstrate CNC machining um, right on the machine floor. We make some widgets. Uh, Chiron Engineering is another partner of ours. So we have probing and we have his uh, detected software on here, um, auto comp software. In this area too now we're starting to introduce uh, robotics thanks to Gossinger and to Universal Robots. We now can demonstrate uh, robotic technology as well as three, more 3D printing, uh, five axis machining from, uh, that was Okuma. Again, it's a whole idea of how do you inspire the next generation. So that's our little museum.